Welcome back to the part four of the lecture on natural language processing, which is part of the big ideas in artificial intelligence. Until now, we have discussed about how to build an artificial intelligence system that uses a deep learning methods or the algorithm in order to extract the meaning out of the text. And then the main idea behind how we extract or how we build a neural net that extracts meaning of any given text was to rely on the fact that the meaning of an individual word is largely determined by which other words, or another way to put it is the context in which it appears is considered, is determined by the context in which the word appears. And furthermore, by using the very same principle, we were able to come up with the idea that is called attention mechanism in order to build a very complicated and large scale neural network that is able to compose the meaning of individual words into the representation or the meaning representation of an entire sentence or even a larger unit that is a general text. And then we have seen in some examples that how this meaning or the meaning that has been captured automatically from natural language text manifests itself in this high dimensional continuous vector space. Now in this fourth part, we want to talk about the other side of the coin. What do I mean by that? Let me first quote Terry Winograd, who is one of the founders of the whole field of artificial intelligence. In his dissertation, he said that language is a system intended to communicate ideas from a speaker to a hearer. What does that mean? It means that the language is not about simply receiving or perceiving the environment. That's just a one side of the coin. Language, the other side of the coin, that is the language, is to be able to communicate back that is to influence the environment by interacting with the other agents or other intelligent entities in the environment. That is, generation is what we need to talk about now. So far, we have talked about language understanding from the perspective of a person who is listening or reading text. But on the other side, somebody else was either writing or speaking, that is, were generating language. And at the end of the day, if our agent or the artificial intelligence system is not able to generate language, but only to understand language, we would not consider this artificial intelligent agent as fully exploiting the ben benefit of natural language, which we believe, as we discussed at the very first part of the lecture, is crucial component that sets us humans apart from all the other intelligent species on this earth. So we're now going to build or think about or discuss how to build a system that is able to both understand language and also to generate language. Interesting thing uh, I need to discuss a bit quickly, briefly here is that generation turned out to be just like classification. You already have learned what classification is and then what are involved or the, what kind of basic building blocks are involved to build a classifier already in the first lecture as well as in the second lecture on computer vision earlier. In classification or more like a conventional classification, we are going to be given an input such as this image of a panda taking a good rest on the grass next to the water and then we're going to build a system that is able to tell us to which category this image or the object within this image belongs. In this particular case, this image or the object in this image belongs to the class named giant panda bear. Now, it turned out language generation is not too different. Let's consider a problem of machine translation. That is, we want to build a system that's going to take as the input a source sentence or a sentence written in a source language. In this particular example, is a sentence written in Korean. And then the goal of machine translation system is to generate or predict 
what is translation is in a target language, in this particular example, English. So why is it just classification? Because all you, all this machine translation system needs to do is to classify a given sentence into one of many possible categories where each category corresponds to one possible sentence in a target language. Now, in this case, we do have a lot of possible sentences. In other words, we have a lot of possible classes. However, if we simply assume for now that the computational complexity doesn't matter, then it indeed is simply a classification problem. In this particular example that you're seeing on the slide, the input is pandaga hangaroi shigo isimida, a Korean sentence. And then the correct answer, that is the correct class to which this source sentence needs to be classified, is a giant pet or the class name, a giant panda bear is resting leisurely. All right. So then have we already learned how to solve this whole problem? Of course, if that were the case, it would have been too easy. It turned out the issue of having a lot of sentences or the possible classes, it makes the whole problem very complicated. So in conventional classification, we know or that we assume that there is no known structure among these classes a priori, that is before we look at the data or knowing how to solve the problem. In this particular case of the object or the animal classification, a priori, that is before we think too much about the problem or looking at the data, we do not assume that there is any known relationship among all these different species or the names of the species. So a priori, we're not going to know the giant panda bear is somewhat similar looking to Gibbon, nor we're not going to assume that the Galapagos penguin looks anything like Gantu penguin. However, all these similarities among these classes, just like what we talked about when we talked about how to extract the meaning of a word out of the data, will arise by, from looking at a lot of data with the associated input and this class. However, a priori again, we do not assume any structures or the regularities among the classes in conventional classification. In generation, however, the story is a bit different. In generation, it is classification. However, we assume that each class arises from the composition of simpler units. Let's take as an example, the class named or that corresponds to a giant panda bear is resting leisurely. Now this sentence or this class does not appear out of nowhere. In fact, this sentence or this class is composed of uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight tokens or the seven words plus a period sign at the end. And then each and every such word comes from a fixed vocabulary of all possible words. So the first word A comes from the vocabulary. The second word giant comes from the very same vocabulary. Panda also comes from the very same vocabulary. Bear, same thing there, is resting leisurely all of them, including the period. What it means is that the, there is a some kind of structure governing the process of enumerating all these possible classes that correspond to all these possible sentences. By thinking about this underlying structure, now we can make the problem of classification or problem of generation that is classification with the very, very large set of classes into a set of or the sequence of simpler problems. And in particular for language generation, it turned out that we can view the problem of language generation as 
sequential decision making. That is a problem where we need to build a system that makes a decision one step at a time based on what was given to this machine at the beginning and what kind of decisions have been taken so far. And as an example, we're going to consider the problem of machine translation that we just talked about. Let's stick to the same example from before. The source sentence is in Korean. 판다가 한가로이 쉬고 있습니다. Given this, at the very first step, the decision had to be made and the decision has to be that a word A is selected from all possible words in this fixed vocabulary. And now given the choice of A and the fact that the, we are translating 판다가 한가로이 쉬고 있습니다, in step two, our machine needs to make a decision to choose giant out of all the words in the vocabulary. And then this process continues over and over until it is determined automatically again by the machine that the whole sentence, the source sentence has been translated. That is that the full translation has been generated. And once this process, this sequential decision-making process is done, we just need to collect all the decisions that, has, that have been made throughout the process. In this particular case, we're going to collect all these decisions and then put all of them in a line and we read it out as the translation that has been generated by our machine. And what is the translation? A giant panda bear is resting leisurely. Reasonable translation, not the perfect one, but I think we can live with it. Now, what this tells us is that the generation is a sequence of classification. Why is that so? Our decision-making, so the decision-making part of the sequential decision-making corresponds to making a decision out of a fixed number of possible decisions at each time step. That is, we want to choose one of the many possible classes. And what is that? That's just classification. What we do, what we have actually just talked about, although we talked about the sequential decision-making, which is a much fancier phrase than classification, it turned out that the generation in this context is identical to a sequence of classification problems or a sequence of solving classification problems. So at each time step, that is at the each time of writing out one target word, we are going to consider the full source sentence, in this case, 판다가 한가로이 쉬고 있습니다, and what have been generated so far. In this case, a giant panda. And given these two types of information, our classifier is going to choose one class, i.e. word, from a set of small number of all possible unique words or unique classes. Once we view it from here, then it becomes a bit straightforward or relatively natural how we are going to solve this problem with the modern day artificial intelligence. That is by building a large scale neural network that's going to take as the input a source sentence and then what have been translated so far. And based on this, this modern day AI, this large scale neural net is going to try to predict the next word. And because we have already learned what is a good way to be, how, what is a good way to build a neural network that is able to extract the meaning from a sequence of individual words. What was that? That was transformer with the attention mechanism and nonlinear projection, we're going to do exactly the same thing. We are going to concatenate the source sentence and what have been translated so far, that is a prefix of the translation and then fit this concatenated sequence into a very specialized form of transformer. And then at the very end, we get a, a set of 
vectors that represent this concatenation of the source sentence and the prefix of the translation based on which we trying to make a prediction over all possible words in the vocabulary. And then how do we do that last part about the prediction? Well, you should know already, you have taken the first lecture and the second lecture and all the extra lectures that uh, where we have learned about this classification over and over. And then it does not differ at all from classifying images to building a machine translation system. We use the exactly same building block. One interesting consequence of working in this space of the vectorized meaning representation, that is in the middle of this transformer, what we get is the individual word vectors and how they are composed. That's what we learned in the part two and part three of this lecture. But then was there any reason why any one of those word vectors or contextualized word vectors had to be from natural language text? We derived everything starting from natural language text in this lecture just because the title of this lecture is natural language processing. However, it turned out that there's no need to do so. In fact, it turned out we could use the very same convolutional neural network that you already have learned in the lecture on computer vision in order to extract the contextualized representation of an input image and then use those contextualized vector representations as if those were word vectors from the source sentence. And then this entire transformer, the large scale transformer is going to extract this contextualized representation of the concatenation of the input image and the prefix of the translation or the target sentence. So in this particular example you are seeing on the screen, the convolutional neural network is going to extract a contextualized vector representations of this image of a panda, concatenate, and then this, these representation vectors are concatenated with the word vectors from a panda bear that is a part of the target, that is a part of the caption. And then this concatenated sequence of vectors are processed by this large scale transformer or as a matter of fact, any kind of neural network that is able to capture this contextual information. And then ultimately what you want is to make this neural network predict the next word in the target caption of an image. It was one of the most fun thing that we discovered in 2013 to 2015, that the, we built a neural net that is able to capture all this contextualized meaning of text. And then it turned out that the technology or the algorithms that we invented in 2013 to 2015 were equally applicable to multimedia data such as images and video. So this is in fact the demo I just tried online. So I went to the IBM's developer portal and then they had so uh, what they named as max image caption generator. It's nothing really special. It's a very old technique, but they kindly made a web demo out of it. So I wanted to just try it out. I took the very same image that we've been using over and over as an example in this part, uploaded it to the web API. And then this web demo gave back to me, came back with me three possible captions that were automatically generated based on this image. The first one, a panda bear sitting on top of a tree. The second one, a panda bear sitting in the grass next to a tree. Third one, a panda bear sitting on top of a tree branch. The second one looks pretty reasonable. I like it. Of course, you can imagine that the, you could build a better system to generate a better image captions. And then that's in fact the case with the more state of the art reason image caption generation models. However, 
based purely on exactly what I told you, you can almost immediately build such an image caption generation system yourself and even deploy it if you want it. So this uh, generation as a sequence of classification has become a one of the most dominant paradigms in natural language generation and the list of applications of such natural language generation paradigm has only been going. Machine translation was one of the first applications we have noticed the power of this so-called sequence to sequence learning. And this technology has been deployed in real life. Google Translate uses exactly the same technology that I just described to you. On your phone, these neural networks are running you know, whenever you ask your phone to translate any sentence. Speech recognition systems use some part of the technologies that I have presented today. And then it works extremely well these days, at least in a limited scenarios. Compared to how it used to work, let's say 10 years ago, this is revolutionary. Dialogue systems. These are still very, very bad uh, in my opinion. However, it, these dialogue systems are getting better and better each day. In fact, we're going to hear more about the so-called open domain dialogue models in the next lecture by Emily Dinan from Facebook AI Research. Of course, these are not only for fun or for, let's say, your intellectual curiosity. There are some of the application areas that are just very, very important. For instance, Facebook deployed recently so-called automatic alt text that generates an alt text, alternative text in the HTML based on an image content automatically. So we are supposed to, whenever we unload some image to the web using whatever the service you want, we are supposed to write an alternative text so that the, even on a browser that does not support images or even for people who cannot see are able to view the content or hear or read the content of an image. However, we almost never do. People really rarely do that. Then the idea that Facebook had was that they let's use this idea of the image caption generation, as well as more broadly, object recognition and text generation in order to automatically create this alternative text for many of the important images that are missing alternative text. And as I, as I said, this list of applications is ever growing and is very, very fascinating. Now, this concludes the part four of this lecture. I only have the final part remaining. Please take a break. Once, when, you're com uh, when you come back, we're going to talk a bit about the implications or the consequences of statistical methodologies in natural language processing as well as generation and talk about the future of natural language processing.